Welcome to Adapted, the podcast where we explore adaptations of various forms. I'm today's host, Tom, and with me is... Pat and KJ. Today we'll be discussing Pride and Prejudice from 1813 and its 1995 television adaptation and 2005 movie adaptation. So this is the classic novel. I don't think we need a lot of plot description here. It is taking place in the early 1790s. There is a family with five daughters that need to be married off. A handsome, rich, but seemingly prideful man named Mr. Darcy moves into the area and catches the eye of Elizabeth Bennet, the second daughter in that family. They seem to dislike each other at first, but over time move eventually to become married. This movie, this story has been retold many, many times in many film adaptations, in many novel adaptations, in sequels, prequels, pornography, alternative universes where they are fighting zombies in an apocalyptic scenario. It's, it's very popular. And its model has become kind of the model for romantic comedies even coming forward. Let's start it up here. Um, and today we are talking about the, the 1995 television edition, the very famous BBC edition with Colin Firth as Mr. Darcy and also the 2005 Joe Wright version of this with Matthew McFadden and Kira Knightley in the lead roles. And we'll be exploring the, the differences between them, what they adapt from the novel, as well as bringing in other adaptations as we see fit. So guys, what do you think? Do you, we think these adaptations of Pride and Prejudice were successful? Were the characters and narrative captured in the adaptation? Did the adaptation take advantage of the film medium or leave off an opportunity? What do you guys think? I can start. Yeah, why don't you start? Yeah, sure. Um, so for me personally, I, I mean, I brought these forward because I think both of these are very successful. And I, I do like Pride and Prejudice quite a lot. I like Jane Austen. I've read her six great novels more than once, and I've read Pride and Prejudice more than twice, more than three times. I, I really like that book. And I think both of these adaptations are are kind of wonderful. I think the 2005 adaptation is one of my favorite movies. It's got to be like a top top 50, top 20 movie, something like that for me. I, I think it's a gorgeous film. Uh, I also, I really love Joe Wright. I love his direction, even in movies that I aren't, I'm, I'm not quite as fond of. But I think this movie is excellent. I think it is beautiful i think it's um i think it's acted wonderfully but i think it's also very very different in tone than the book even though it's really in terms of the plot following the plot pretty closely as much as it can in a two-hour version of this the, the 1995 version i find to be um i find to be very loyal to the book but both in terms of the plot and the tone. I mean, it also follows the book exactly. And it, it, because it's six hours long, it has the space to do it. I think it does things differently from the book in terms of the sort of narrative innovations that Jane Austen was doing. And granted, one is prose, one is a movie. So you do have to make those transformations. The, the movie doesn't the, the 1995 version doesn't necessarily have to make those transformations, and I don't quite understand why they do it. The 05 one, though it does feel very, very different, um, it's like the, the romance in it is like cranked up to 11 in some scenes, and yet in a lot of ways it seems to be more respectful of the, the narrative style, the sort of innovative third-person style that Jane Austen was using. And so I think that that's kind of juxtaposition is really interesting because the 05 one is often seen as departing more from the book but i think in terms of um in terms of the the narrative style that austin uses it it's actually a little closer to the book than the 95 one um so i think these these three things work interestingly in a conversation i could talk about why i think that is and whatnot but just give up my first impressions I guess I'll give my first impressions. Um, so the 2005 film, I do enjoy quite a bit. 
you know, there, there are certain things I think it get it gets interestingly correct because, and this is where I think film adaptation comes into play. Like there are certain things I think that the 2005 film does really interestingly, like the first dance when they show up that literally I go, this feels, I remember when I, when I watched it, I go, this feels like it should be in Hobbiton. Like there's, <laughs> there's just like, mm. there's, there's a joyful quality where, you know, they're sort of dancing and they actually do a good job of, of sort of establishing levels of society, which really is what Jane Austen's novel is about. Mm -hmm. And so you sort of have, it, it makes them a little too countrified, especially if you compare it to the dances in say the, the mini series, the television one. You know, they, they they you know they literally show a pig walking through their house with like a pig's balls hanging out. <laughs> like it, it's <laughs> they're really trying to emphasize like these are this is a this is a lower level of society. Now it is barely a lower level of society. The, the and the miniseries makes this very clear. At one point they say, "I am I am you know the my father is a gentleman. You know, Mister Darcy is the a same gentleman. class. Like, we are the same class, mm -hmm. so I don't know why you're making such a big deal of this. And but the film, the the 2005 film, does a better job for a modern audience of making that very clear. Um, it feels like the two the 2005 one was meant more for an American audience. The 1995 one was meant more for a British audience. A British audience would pick up on those on those cues much more clearly than an American audience would. So they literally have to show a pig walking through their house, <laughs> like you know, like mm. that with his balls. Like, like that was you know, I get it. But that was what the 2005 film was making very clear. And it makes it very clear that then you get to say, um, you know, the next level of society. And then you get to say, Lady, I can't remember her name. Catherine Judy Dench. DeBerg. DeBer yeah. yeah you Judy Dench. <laughs> yes, Judy Dench. You get to Judy Dench's house, and that is clearly the highest level of society. So it actually does a good job of making clear the levels of society. It actually does a good job, I think, of making clear a lot of it. And I will be very honest that one made me want to read the books again i did actually when i when i watched the kira knightley movie i went oh i actually kind of want to go back and read it again like i i read the book i very much enjoy the book but i thought i kind of want to go back and and read that one more time because i thought there's a lot that i might have missed in it however the i prefer the miniseries i think i think the miniseries is better i think i prefer the miniseries because this is the question i want to pose with the 2005 film, if you didn't know it was based on a classic book, would you accept that film? Oh, that's I the would. question. Yeah, I would. But... I wouldn't mm -hmm. because oh, why is that? because there's some big plot flaws in it. If you were to because of how quickly it has to go through things, which I respect because it's only a two hour movie, but. As an adaptation, I think it misses it misses a bunch of cues. For example, if this was a film by itself and you got a good hour and 25, hour and 30 minutes in, and then they that's when they introduce Wickham. Wickham doesn't get introduced until a good hour and a half, hour, 15 minutes into the movie. He feels like he's like tacked into the movie. And they're like, we got to get this element in here to make the rest of the plot make sense. If that was a script by itself, I don't think you would accept him as a plot element. That's a big one of my criticisms of that film, because you could tell the 2005 movie without Wickham. You could make the film work, but it wouldn't be Pride and Prejudice. Mm -hmm. And so in order for it to be Pride and Prejudice, you have to get Wickham in there. And he gets very shoehorned in. He feels like they're like, we gotta get it. We gotta get a scene. We have to get a scene with him and Elizabeth to make it, you know, to, to make it very clear that they that they could be love interest, but they're not. And then we're gonna move on. And then we have to make a very quick scene with with him running off with the with the sister. And then we gotta and then we're gonna make a very quick scene. It just felt like they were like, we gotta get we gotta get this guy in here, but we don't but we we don't know what to do with him. And if you you could rewrite if Pride and Prejudice 2005 movie was a standalone movie, you would never put that extra in there. You would cut it. But you need him to be the thing that reveals Darcy's generosity, right? Because it's Darcy who turns out to make it possible that they're able to get married. True, and... but why couldn't, if this was a film that didn't involve, you could make it work without him. Be and again, I'm not saying in the book you can't. I'm not saying in the miniseries you can't. But in the 2005 film you could. All it has to be is Darcy goes and orchestrates. He goes out and voluntarily orchestrates the marriage between 
um uh, Jane Bingley. And... Yeah, Jane and Bingley. And he makes that marriage work and he brings them all together. I mean, again, it would feel a little bit too much like American Pie 3 or something, but he <laughs> will bring them together. And then that would be the shorthand for, oh, he's not as bad of a guy as we thought he was. And that's how that film would come together. You mm-hmm. don't need Bingley in the 2000, or you, you don't need Wickham in the 2005 film. They have to put him in there because otherwise it's not Pride and Prejudice. Yeah, but you also then, the other element you lose, and maybe it's when he's put in, but the other element you lose is her disdain for Darcy. Somewhat, it's not just that he's prideful, but that she thinks he's done this terrible thing, that he's kind of disinherited this guy and, and kicked him out. But his terrible thing could be that he separated Jane and Bingley. Yeah, and she also thinks that. Yeah, I guess, yeah, you could, it's, you could it's an streamline added, this is, it. Yeah, you could have streamlined it, and any screenwriter would have done that. Mm-hmm. because they would they wouldn't have had these two things running they would have made it one thing there's and this is the problem with the 2005 film you don't need both of them but they're both they you need both of them in the book you need both of them in the miniseries but in the way that the 2005 film is presented you don't need them mm-hmm. so it's a i actually really like the 2005 film i, I don't want to bash i don't want to make it sound like i don't like it but it it's a we i think and you could make an argument either way is it a really i think if it wasn't known that there was mo- more going on with the wickham scene i think anybody watching it who you don't have to have read the book you could just know there is a book and you would watch it and you would go something seems rushed about this but i know why it's rushed because i'm i'm getting a cliff notes version of this thing Mm -hmm. and it might inspire me to go read the book and find out what more is going on with this thing but i think if you watch this film by itself you would go why is why is this here this doesn't Mm -hmm. make any sense why would they add this extra element in um that's my that's my biggest issue with the 2005 film. Now I love I think Kieran Knightley is a much better uh, Eliza Bennett, and I mm-hmm. think, um, uh, but I but I also think Colin Firth is a better Mr. Darcy. So you if I get the two of them together, um, I don't want to bash the 2005 one, but I just think there's a flaw in it because if you didn't know it was based on a, on a book, I don't think you would accept some of its rushed scenery. You could also argue that's its strength. It knows it knows it's the screenwriters knew it was based on a book. They knew they could get away with a shorthand. And so they did it and they still made a good film. So this was my introduction to Pride and Prejudice. I had not read the book, hadn't seen a movie. I'd heard the name Mr. Darcy, but honestly, I thought that was from, um, ah, what's the other book? It might've been a Jane Austen. No, Jane Eyre. I thought Mr. Darcy was from Jane Eyre. Rochester, yeah. Yep, Rochester. Rochester. Yeah, so- Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I had no idea going into this. So it's interesting that you're saying now that uh, Wickham didn't show up until an hour and 20 in. I would have sworn he was in there earlier. But again, I, I didn't know what to expect. I had no idea. But I completely understand why people love this story and these characters and why it was inspiration for all the um, romantic comedies like you were saying nowadays, Tom. I do think the movie was better. Um, and I. I think it worked well as a film because there was some beautiful sweeping shots. There's some beautiful shots of yeah, the manners. The camera and... work is the right. camera works great. They make really good use of that. I'm assuming it's like a. It must be some sort of like you know gyroscope camera that they carry. It has mm-hmm. to be because they're walking through all these scenes. It's it's really good it's camera. Work. Gorgeous. <laughs> also, it's much sillier than the miniseries. The movie is much sillier than the TV show. To its benefit, people in the 2005 movie are having fun. They're enjoying doing this. It's almost like they wish they could have done this their whole life, and now they get the chance. In 1995, it looks like everybody's showing up for work. They're either a little stressed out. They think they're a little out of their league or something. I, I mean, Mrs. Bennett's such a good example, right? In the 2000 or in the 1995 one, she's. I, I think. What did you say, Pat? She sounds like Miss Piggy the whole time, just like, oh no. My daughters, what am I gonna do? Running around with the 2005, it was almost like Molly Weasley, like comforting her daughters into these marriages. Like it, it just worked so much better. I like what you're saying there, KJ, about the um, like it's sillier, it's looser, and it the the people do really seem like they're having a lot of fun, and it's looser. And and what you were mentioning about with the pig with the balls walking through the house like it, it's also very dusty and kind of mm. dirty right mm-hmm. like the place like the, the, it feels like it's a lived-in space and the the bbc miniseries i don't know how many 
of them you've seen, but th they're kind I of watched all of it. No, 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 not of the, just that, but like oh, BBC sorry. miniseries generally. Oh, oh none. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like um, yeah. I saw that. I'm an American. <laughs> uh, the, some of the Jane Austen ones are good. The Persuasion one is is pretty much worth is worth your time. Also, if you get a chance, I don't think it's. I think it's only like a two hour movie though. It's not a full mini series, but um, there is a sort of like polished quality to the BBC stuff, where it's you're not going to see anything out of place. There's not going to be a hair out of place. It's going to be kind of very proper and 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 all that um it's what Jane stiffer. Austen is yeah I I mean I think that's right I, I don't that's not that's not a criticism of the BBC miniseries it is more it's it's more um yeah it, it feels like people are on stage more I think it is a little a little tighter and that's fine I mean we're dealing with a comedy of manners it's a book about proper matters right like this what is a good person and what's a bad person or what's a, a high class person or a low class person not in terms of actual class but in terms of their value is how well they respect the customs of whatever space they're in and the, you know the bbc miniseries grabs that very well because but it does make it feel you know kind of tight well i think i agree with you kg like these people feel like they're having a lot of fun um, they really do feel like a family of sisters. Like this, this seems to be like when sisters are together, how they actually would act, right? They're kind of dopey and kind of like a little silly. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I love watching those those girls together, especially um, the two younger daughters. They're wonderful in the the O five one. I think it's uh, Casey Mulligan and um, oh, who's the other one? The other actress is also a person um actors not people yeah actors are not people that's true the other actor not human is uh jenna malone yeah oh carrie mulligan sorry carrie mulligan and jenna malone were uh, lydia and kitty and like the two of them seem like they're overjoyed to be together when they're like running around the party and seeing all the soldiers um and I think that's what I like about the, the 05 version and what I like, why I like it more than the 95 version is it does have that kind of, um, it does have that kind of life to it. Or when she's getting the letter and she's sick when she's getting the letter, which I don't think they directly mention in the 05 version, right? When she gets the letter from Darcy, which is a, a really big scene in the book. Um, and they, they, they do kind of crank it up to 11 when she gets the letter, right? She's like staring in the mirror and then he comes in behind her. And then we have that cut through the woods of him riding on the horse as fast as possible with his sexy coat flailing in the wind, you know, that type of thing. Um, but even there, like I'm really, I was really into it. I really liked the kind of the intensity of that. Um, and I, I think that goes to what I think the 05 captures that is sometimes lost in the 95 version is... The, the kind of free, what's called free indirect speech, which Jane Austen did, which is basically, it's third person narration, but the third person narrator is sort of talking in the voice of one of the characters. And so you get kind of like Lizzie's voice in throughout the, throughout the book, but it's, it's in third person still. So it just kind of sounds like her, you know, like Game of Thrones, or, we're reading that now, or for the, for the Game of Thrones episode. And it's clearly like no character's voice is sort of taking that over. It's sort of a removed narrator, but the sort of free and direct speech stuff is how Jane Austen kind of structures her book. And, you know, it's sort of something she kind of innovates. And in the 95 version, it's weird. Like there's a lot of scenes, not, not a tremendous amount, but a few scenes where they're not from Bennett's point of view. Like we just see Darcy on his own. Like there's a scene where he's like sword fighting for some reason. And he decides, like, oh, I, I can fix this. There's something has gone wrong. And he's There's like, well, a scene in the bath, too. That's the sexy scene. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There's a scene in the bath. And the beginning, it also begins, the first thing you hear is Darcy and, and Bingley talking. Like, they're riding past the estate. And you hear them talking. And then it cuts into to Elizabeth Bennet. And so there's this odd thing of, like, we get Darcy outside of her perspective we don't get that in 05. The 05 version is very, I think, in a certain way, more respectful of what Austen is doing with narrative in the sense that, like, Elizabeth's perspective sort of shapes the atmosphere. 
like when she's sick and waiting for that letter, or she's not waiting for the letter, but when she's sick and she gets the letter, like the, the scene is sort of hazy and over the top and weird because she's not feeling that well and she's having this intense experience. Um, the, the 95 version isn't doing that and doesn't necessarily need to, but having Darcy, when you see like Darcy on his own, it's a strange choice and you don't really need it because it doesn't happen that often. And I, I don't quite get it. I think it's a, a point in the, in the miniseries that feels not like it's gone off the rails, but it's that it's not working very well. I think it's done in the miniseries because it's, it's a classic, like you got to show what's going on and then the audience won't worry about what's going on. So they, if you don't have, if you don't show for, you know, the big, you know, those scenes with Darcy are sort of like, I don't know why they're there. Mm-hmm. You, you really get this when Darcy is going around looking for Wickham and Liddy. Yes. And so, and I think they do it because otherwise as an audience member, you're going to spend 30 minutes being like, what's going on you know and, and in some ways it actually i think would be better i don't know you know i get why they do it but i'm not quite certain because otherwise you really are going to be in in the the minds of the rest of the Bennets. what's going on in london who's solving the situation we have no idea what's going on but they're not willing to put the audience through that and so they stick you know uh they, they stick him in there so that you can see him going around London solving the problem. I think that's why they're doing it there. And I suspect that's why they're doing it in the other scenes as well, so that the audience doesn't have to wonder about how Darcy's doing. You know, is is has Darcy given up? What is Darcy doing? And that's what, of course, they're all thinking, you know, or at least, you know, what Miss Bennett is thinking. But I think that there, the it's an attempt to sort of assuage the audience's concerns to say no 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 he's still interested he's he's out there fencing away his desires I think that's what they're doing and I maybe you have to do it in film this is this becomes the question do you need to do it because it's film because the book doesn't do it do you need to do it because it's film because an audience will sort of get too concerned? That's almost what it feels like. They were worried the audience would get too concerned that Darcy has given up and they wanted to make it very clear. No, 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 Darcy hasn't given up. Don't you worry, dear audience. There, He's coming back. That's sort of what it felt like. Yeah, I don't think you need it at all. The 05 version doesn't do it and it benefits from it. Because I, my what it feels like in the book But the is 05 that... version is only two hours you you the audience yeah, they, only has the they audience don't, they only don't has have as much 15 time minutes where they're yeah, concerned to, to about it. it whereas the mini series <laughs> has two hours where they're concerned about it where they if, if you didn't have those scenes in the middle the audience has a good two hours between the sequences and yeah, they might more... they might get concerned about it yeah i i think it because in the book the feel of it is we're dealing with another problem this is an independent problem and then you learn it was darcy not the uncle who solved it and that it's like, oh, this is how this connects, right? Because it's it's suddenly it's like you know she she sees Darcy at Pemberley, right? And then when she then after that she gets the news at Pemberley yeah. that um, Dar- Pemberley is Darcy's estate. That she, that's the scene where they visit and they think Darcy's away, and then he's he comes back, and then she's oh, I'm so embarrassed. Um, but you know, so they kind of drop. <laughs> you could that. be Lizzie Tom. Yeah. Him again. <laughs> the 2005 film handles that scene much better with like the yeah. quick shot of her like looking through the door. They handle that scene much better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love the Pemberley scene when they go in and see yeah. like the sculpture of him yeah. and, and they, all they, that. They handles it much better than yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's a transformation and that's an adaptation benefit too, or um, something that the film medium can give you is you don't really need the maid explaining. This is Mr. Darcy, isn't he? So and you get a little bit of that. But really, that scene is like about Kira Knightley gazing on this man and seeing like really who he is. Um, and they do that entirely with visuals. And the 95 does uh, is much more chatty. But anyway, so she gets the letter at, at Pemberley and then it's kind of like, oh, this is a different issue. We're leaving Darcy behind for a little while. He's not really the, the center anymore. It's about Lydia and the potential disgrace of the family. Um, and you need that, too, because it. it it makes it seem more impossible for Darcy to marry her if it's if her family's disgraced. Um, and so Darcy is away. We're not dealing with him anymore. We're just dealing with Lydia. And then it's this big surprise. So it wasn't so much, you know, when reading it, I don't remember the first time I read it, but the effect for me reading it isn't so much, oh, I wonder what Darcy is doing. It's, oh, crap, we have another problem. This other problem is in the way. A family now has to deal with it. And then 
it's a surprise that that it's actually in fact Darcy who fixes the problem and it also it's really brilliantly in terms of the narrative it's brilliant because it also becomes the final bit of evidence that Darcy is in fact not this complete jerk who's simply prideful but is a person of great generosity as well um, I think the problem with doing that as you're saying Pat in the 95 version is you have like a 50 minute episode where you don't have Darcy and you have you know an expensive, handsome, a lead who is not going to be in your miniseries for one of its episodes or more than like an episode and a half. He's just not going to be there. And so you kind of need these, these scenes where he's going around London and figuring it out. First of all, if you're watching the BBC miniseries of Pride and Prejudice, you've probably read Pride and Prejudice, so you know what's going to happen. And you get to keep Darcy in there. You get to, you get to like, see your actor and have your have it's Colin like for fan fiction version let's watch Colin let's oh I've always yeah, let's to watch Mr. Darcy yeah. solve this problem let's watch it's him solve it's like the West World version we could go behind <laughs> scenes go and with follow Colin Darcy and see what he's doing in London I can also imagine Colin Firth being like give me a few more scenes or find another Darcy yeah, that, I mean I guess that, I don't know him but I you know yeah I guess this is my criticism of the 2005 version though is that if I think it's able to get away with doing that because it's it's rushing through the Darcy story so quickly, mm -hmm. I think it's only able to get away with shunting. I think a book books just have an easier way of shunting characters to the side. We expect in a book, I mean, read you know Game of Thrones is a great example. You, characters disappear for like 150 pages <laughs> before they suddenly resurface again in their own mm. section. Novels do that much easier. We are willing to shunt plots aside much more quickly in novels. We don't do that as quickly in visual medium, especially movies. If you know, we we know during the 15 minutes of Darcy's absence everyone even if you didn't read it is fairly convinced he's still involved i don't think anyone thinks he's not mm -hmm. uh, i think that's that's my you know again i i that's my greatest criticism with the 2005 one is everyone knows he's still there everyone knows he's coming back mm -hmm. it's it's sort of one of the problems with it is that it it even if you don't if you didn't know it was a book you wouldn't accept the wickham subplot you wouldn't yeah, I don't, I just don't know. I, I, I don't know if I entirely agree that you wouldn't accept it. I, I could see your point about it's, it comes in very late and it's very fast. Um, but I don't, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I suppose. I mean, it's an impossible really point to argue. It's yeah, an impossible yeah. point to argue. Mm -hmm. But I, I just feel like that's my greatest criticism of the 2005 one is that I, I really like some of the stuff it does. It actually does some of its shorthand stuff works really well. I especially like this is where I said I, I will defend I will defend Mrs. Uh, uh, Bennett is that, mm -hmm. you know, I, she's got a serious problem on her hands. And I think the 2005 film makes that much clearer. They've got the mm. they've, there's two lines that the 2005 film does that makes the problem of Mr. and Mrs. Bennett much, 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 much clearer. And it's the line where Mrs. Bennett says when, you know, when uh, Liddy is finally that she's married and she's, oh, how wonderful and this kind of stuff. Mm. And Kieran, you know, Kieran Knightley says something like, you know, oh, this is all you're concerned about. And she says, when you have five daughters <laughs> and you're concerned about getting them married, then then you worry about it. She's she has a legitimate worry that she is going to be destitute and poor and be completely on the dependence of everyone else around her. She has a very very legitimate concern. And so she has a she has a very she goes about it in her completely bumbling way. That's very clear. But Mrs. Bennet has a serious problem on her hands and she's dealing with it as best as she possibly can. And again, the 2005 film also allows one of my favorite things, and it makes it very clear about Mr. Bennett, which is when he says, we shall have no peace if we don't allow her to go off to um, wherever she's going to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think uh, Kieran Knightley says something like, oh, is that all you care about is your peace? Or something along those lines. And it becomes very clear. None of those, neither of those lines are in the movie. They're not in the miniseries and they're not in the book. But it becomes very clear. It's like, yeah, he is. That is really all he's concerned about. He, and he feels bad. But if he dies, he dies tomorrow. 
all of his daughters and his wife are destitute out on the street. No mm-hmm. one cares. He doesn't care. He doesn't do <laughs> anything to resolve this problem. Mm-hmm. And so I absolutely feel bad for the rest of them. And he should be censured on this point, but the other mm-hmm. books don't do this. That's why I like the, the 2005 one. It makes some of those points much, 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 much clearer than the mm-hmm. other ones do. Well, I had a question about Mr. Bennett. So in the 1995 miniseries, Judy Dench, um, the character who is Judy Dench in the other one. Oh, she, Catherine, Lady Catherine. Lady Lady Catherine. Lady Catherine de Berg. Says to Elizabeth, your father's a gentleman, but everybody else in your family is not in society. Mm-hmm. Did I misunderstand that or is that? Yeah, so the I could explain that if you would. It's a little... Well, I, I think there's it's like a little, uncle a knight. Isn't the uncle a knight, though? So Darcy's, Darcy's f- uh, father was a rich landowner. His sister um, married the... His, his father's sister married a, the daughter of an earl. And so... Let me, let me start this again. <laughs> anyway, so Dar- Darcy is related to the peerage. Right, the peerage is like dukes, earls, barons, marquesses, uh, and viscounts. I think um, so. They're like up there, and Lady Catherine is his aunt, um, and she's from his his mother's side, the Fitzwilliam side, uh, and so she is an earl because Darcy's grandfather, his mother's father, was an earl, and so they're actually peerage. They're actually like up, upper class. Yeah, I Darcy got all is, that. Yep. Yeah. Darcy's landowner, but Darcy's a landowner. He's much wealthier than, um, he's like 10,000 a year. And I don't know what the hell are the Bennett's, but the Bennett's, I thought it was 10,000. No, he's 10,000. The Bennett's are 2,000. Oh, the Bennett's are 2,000. Oh, okay. Um, but the, the Bennett's, the mother, um, her brothers are like, one's a lawyer, I think. And the other is a like importer exporter, like a, a merchant type. Yeah. One of them's in Cheapside. Yeah, exactly. And Art Vandelay. Yeah, he's Art Vandelay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you get that joke, you are too old. Anyway, um, yeah. So Art and Art Vandelay, and so that's considered like a that's considered like very Whiggish. Like it's you're you're not a, you're not making your money from land or from title. If you're like in trade, that's considered. But sort are of a they different... of society? I don't like, think they, so. No, they got, they're, right, they're, they're not. They're not gentlemen, her right. brothers. So that means Mr. Bennett married outside of society. He's yeah. So that tells you something about their marriage, right? Right. Which is, and he makes it very clear that yeah, <laughs> that not, he made a bad marriage. Yeah, he's not the happiest guy in the world. Yeah, <laughs> um, about it, and so. And it's also kind of Darcy's problem too, because Darcy is the same class as Lizzie. He's, it's not like a, he's not marrying outside of his class. They're not violating like class norms, but that yeah, marriage. But they're, they're on e- each edge of that class, right? He's almost an Earl and she's almost a lawyer. Um, she, she has association. She has members of her family are not gentlemen. I think that's the close. I think that's a decent explanation, though, that yeah. he is just, you know, on yeah. the, on the edge of being totally out of her league, mm-hmm. and she is just on the edge of being totally out of his league. Yeah, they're both right on the edges, mm. but they're not. But that's they're the not. Thing. That's the yeah. thing is they are not, but they are right on the edges. So yeah. you know, for Mrs. Bennett, this is a huge leap upward. For Lady Catherine, this is a huge leap downwards. Mm. Yeah. And that's, and I think, like, another thing that I think, I think the, I don't know if the, I don't know, I'll ask you guys what you think. I think the 05 version does this a little better than the 95 version, but I think one of the things that Darcy says that insults Elizabeth when he first proposes is kind of like, this is sort of against my better interest, but I love you, I want to marry you. And she's like, that's incredibly insulting. But you kind of later- both of them. He says, no, he says it in both of them. But I think my, my point is, I think in the, the 05 version, I think you get to understand his kind of point of view there, which is like, this is going to be trouble if I marry you. And it's not just me being kind of a prick about it. But like you're saying, KJ, he's close to being an Earl, right? I mean, I think there might even be 
a world in which he could become an earl based upon certain people dying and, and whatever. I'm not entirely sure, but um, but I think it's kind of like, yeah, if I marry you, there's going to be trouble for me, right? Like my aunt is not going to talk to me anymore. I'm, you know, people in my social circles are going to disassociate with me. And you, I think you realize that as Lizzie realizes that when she comes in to meet Lady Catherine and all that. I, I think that even though he's still kind of a jerk there, he you kind of get his point a little more. Well, I don't feel that as much in the 95 version. Um, so I'm a little I more like I got that more in the 95 version. Oh, really? Yeah. I thought yeah. I did. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. For sure. Fair and mm -hmm. part of it is because uh, Judy Dench in the 1995 mm -hmm. version She's in the O5 version. Me. No, I know. I, what was her name? Lady Catherine. Lady Catherine. Lady explains Catherine. that in the 95 version. I understood she was way wealthier because of the way she <laughs> could act and boss people around. But I didn't quite understand. I, I didn't understand that uh, Kiera Knightley's family was, you know, again, just in. Like right there on that, on that line. So this was my first, as I mentioned, this was my first introduction to Pride and Prejudice. What about your first introduction, Pat? So here's the thing. I think I'm a, I'm like, I'm a reasonably well-read individual. Like I've, I've, you know, I'm not, I'm not as well-read as Tom by no means, but like I've read a lot of books, but so I've, I had never read any Jane Austen. So this was like probably at this point, almost 15 years ago, this is like 2010 or so. And I was at the bookstore and I thought, and I, you know, and I saw a copy of Pride and Prejudice and I thought I should, I should read this. Like, this is one of those things Like I should, I've never read any Jane Austen. I should read Pride and Prejudice. So I picked up the book and I was like, I have no idea what it's about. Like literally no idea. And I read the back of it and it's like the, you know, the, the daughters, you know, they need to marry and they're looking, you know, and Mr. Bingley and Mr. You know, they, and it was like, but complicating their process are the zombies that are haunting the countryside. <laughs> and I literally read this and went, huh. I had no idea there were zombies in Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> but in my defense, I went, well, you know, like there's Frankenstein and mm -hmm. um, there's ghosts and Weathering Heights and Dracula's mm -hmm. come out of that. I had no idea that the origin of like zombie stories was Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> but I was thinking about this and if I was flipping through the text mm -hmm. and it's it's sort of like regular, you know, Pride and Prejudice is interspliced with zombie stories. So if you read it quickly, you're going, oh, yeah, I guess that's what it's about. <laughs> so I flipped to the front of the book and then I looked at it and it's like a picture of like this, like, you know, they're in sort of like this Edwardian dress, but it's like ripped open and there's like, you know, like all this like, like cleavage visible and like a rotten mouth. And I looked at it and went, this cannot be <laughs> what I thought this was about. <laughs> That's great. But I spent yeah. a good a good minute and a half in a Barnes and Noble looking at this <laughs> book going, Oh, I guess that's uh Jane Austen wrote about zombies. <laughs> the origin of the zombie story. That was is the origin of the Jane zombie story, Austin. as far as I was yeah. thought, as far as I was concerned. So Yeah. That's funny. Because like you can believe it too, because like this comes out a few years yeah. before Frank St Frankenstein. Yeah, that was like, why that was my logic. It was like, mm. oh, I had no mm. idea. That's what yeah. that's what this book was about. Yeah, you've had like the gothic stories from like what was Cath um Castle of Entranto? It was like seventeen seventy seventeen ninety three or so? Something like that? Yeah, okay. something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is actually when like this book probably takes pl place. So yeah. That makes sense. I could see like a yeah. I could see like zombie stories being written <laughs> but it, it, at this time period. Yeah, but not in Jane not in Austin. Jane Austen. Not in no. Jane Austen. That was my experience. That was my first experience yeah. with Jane Austen. Yeah, I I think um I think what they had the person wrote that book is they basically had Pride and Prejudice and then just kind of added things yeah, in. Just, so if you skim it, <laughs> it looks very <laughs> legit. Yeah. And he did that with Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters, too. And that was the other one. Um, the Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, I think, was made into a a movie that I'm told wasn't as fun as the book. But So I, one more thing to compare the uh, the two. I, I, will, I, I like the 05 version much better than the 95 version. But I think the cousin might have been better in the 95 version. I oh, think yeah. The, I think the cousin's more sympathetic in the 05 version. 
but he's hilarious in the 95 version. <laughs> yeah. That man is brilliant. Yeah. The facial expressions, the way his mm-hmm. eyes are like half closed. You can just see like <laughs> You can just see his stupidity closing his <laughs> eyes. That, that actor is brilliant. Yeah, I love it. You're right. He is much more sympathetic in the 2005 version, but he is much better in the mm. 95 version. That character is the best. Yeah, that, he has like a worm quality to him. He looks like a, like a little chubby worm with mm-hmm. his like head sticking out. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I just like because this is the 95 version does the weirdest thing. I'm like, why did they the 2005 one? Why did they set the scene where they're like they're in church, like listening to his sermon? And then they have that be the scene where they reveal like that that Darcy had pulled Bingley away. I'm like, why did they do this? It's such a weird place for that scene. And yet it could be so much better because like the the 95 one has him like reading from the, his book of like sermons while he's like oh, I thought I would sermons. read to you from... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so good that is such a great character yeah yeah he he's more like in the book he's definitely much more of a moralizing blowhard um and I don't think that gets lost, <laughs> then, then, gets lost. no 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 I, I said then in the 05 version yes yes yeah i think he's much more moralizing and and sort of um and quick to offend in the book in the 95 version in the 05 version the 05 version he's like you get the impression he's like on the spectrum kind of like he just doesn't get social relations um but yeah in the in the book and in the 95 version he's like he's he's always kind of moralizing and scolding a little bit especially at the end when he's and they, they take this out they take this out of the 95 version and it's not in the 05 version anyway either from the book and i, I like this scene with mr bennett and um and he writes a letter to mr bennett after lydia gets married and he's like it is the christian interest that we should forgive but you should never let her back into your home again then mr bennett's like an interesting notion of christian forgiveness he has um, oh i remember that yeah, yeah which I, I really liked and they cut that from the 95 version i was like oh you know that's a you know that's I, a hard because you have to shift because no, there's no nothing you know pretty much everything goes through eliza like through eliza like is, is mm-hmm. it eliza am i saying it wrong eliza. they call her eliza sometimes call her eliza, eliza lizzie lizzie elizabeth yeah yeah so they call her eliza yeah i don't know which to go with uh, I'll go with Eliza. So mm-hmm. I, I think it's partially because, for the most part, everything goes to the lies, the the nexus of Eli of of Eliza. Like if you shift it, so everything goes through Eliza to every other character. There's very little that would go directly from Collins to her father. That would almost that would that would make like a you, you'd have to adjust the narrative construct. And I think for the 2005 film, that's really hard. Very little goes through anything except through Kira mm-hmm. Knightley. Yeah. You could maybe do it in the 2005 one, but it's a lot harder, to, or the 95 one, but it's a lot harder to do. Yeah, they they sort of do it where he comes in and starts talking to the to Jane. Yes, which is great. Lizzie. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they don't. Yeah, they don't have that line. I mean, it's one. And line. they have the great line where it's like, "Well, then you shouldn't be seen with us." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, and he like considers it, and he's like, "Oh yeah, You're right. I sure. shouldn't be around you." <laughs> that's why I just he's got to be my, you know. The, the the character that came by far the most alive between the book and the films was Mr. Collins. Yeah. It was, you know, I got Darcy. I get Elizabeth Bennett. I get pretty much everybody else. I sort of got them. I never quite got the comedy of Mr. Collins until you see him in film. He <laughs> translates brilliantly to film way mm-hmm. better than I think he does in the book. I never yeah. quite got the joke in the book. Like I got that he was a bore. I got it. I didn't get quite how funny he was. Yeah, and I, I like Tom Hollander's performance too in the O five. He's the O five Collins. He's great. Um, yeah, yeah, I think he's great. And I, I, there's a, a thing they do in the O five version. I don't know if it's in the ninety five. I thought it maybe there was a little bit of it where Mary, the third daughter, who's I love Mary. I like Mary too. Or Mary. But you you always in the in the O five version you always see her looking after Mister Collins, because they have the same interests kind of. She's they also should have ended of, up together. I think it's yeah. just, you know I I get why she Austin didn't do it, but they should have. They yeah. were meant for each other. They were meant for each other, and like in the O five version, it's there. Like she's always looking after yeah. him whenever he's moving. I didn't quite see that in the ninety five version. 
I thought they were going to do that at one point, but but they didn't. And I really like that. There's the extended scene where Lizzie dances with Darcy. Um, and you have that extent one camera movement that starts, um, you know, that goes through the house. It ends with Lizzie in that kind of blue light. Uh, and you see in there, like Mary looking after Mr. Collins, like he kind of passes and she looks after him. And then she goes and plays the piano and the dad comforts her after. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that was a nice detail in the 05 version because it's like clear, clearly they should have ended up together. Yeah, it's nowhere like, in the book, but if you, yeah. and again, in the movies, you're like, oh gosh, why? I mean, again, yeah. I don't think she could. It would have been too neat. Doesn't she end up being a nun? Didn't she go to like a cloister? I, I thought she married one of her uncle's clerks. It did really make me want to read the book again, though. I actually did. I, I was very much thinking, I'm like, oh, I must have missed a lot when I read it. Um, besides the zombies. <laughs> <laughs> Taking advantage of the film medium. Yeah, I think you're right. Like the Collins comes alive more there. Um, There's just certain aspects. I will say the thing that comes alive in the film medium as opposed to the book, the 2005 version does a better job of of making certain, especially the class aspects, more visible than they are in the book. Because it's a little, I think, especially as a as a twenty first century American, you know, it is really hard to necessarily understand where their class distinctions are. I think it's a little more obvious if you come from a society that has class distinctions. It's especially more obvious if you come from a nineteenth century society. It's a little hard from a twenty first century American. The movie, the the two thousand five movie, makes it much, 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 much clearer what the class distinctions are. I actually did very much. You know, again, I know how the movie book works but i think the movie does a much better job of making that a lot clearer mm -hmm. a lot more easily so i did actually really like that aspect and i do think it's just pretty it's a very pretty mm -hmm. movie i think it works very well but i don't but i do i just have issues with how it i don't think the 2005 movie works unless you know it has a book behind it i think it just i think if you had it as its own movie i don't know if we would be talking about it if it wasn't based on Pride and Prejudice, the book, mm -hmm. I think the miniseries can stand on its own. Even if you didn't know a book was behind it, you would still think it was a pretty impressive achievement mm -hmm. in and of its own right. Now, yeah. it's much slower. It's a lot less obvious exactly what's going on and what the class distinctions are. But I actually think that is a more standalone piece of film or, or whatever you want to call it. But I think that's a more standalone piece than the 2005 one is. I think the medium of film was used more in the 05 version. They just took advantage of that more. And there's, you know, little scenes in which they do that. I think one thing that I liked, but you guys might not, it, it is a little, it's a lot, is when they first dance together and they intercut it with them alone in a room dancing. And then they cut back to them at the party dancing. I really like that. And that's Oh, something... that was nice. Yeah. That was good. Oh. That was mm -hmm. actually really good. I liked that. I will agree. I did like yeah. that. Yeah, I think things like that worked very well in the movie. Um, yeah, like her getting the letter uh, also had was was very kind of visually arresting. Even the, um, the scene where they're they're outside in the rain having the argument. That's a much yeah. better mm -hmm. position to have that argument. It's much. Mm -hmm. It is definitely much more Strumen Drung or whatever. It is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Strumen Grund. Strumen Grund. <laughs> Strumen Drug. Strumen Drug. Whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Go to, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I know, and and I think what a lot of like Austin people don't, I think that's a scene that Austin people don't like, even though I love it. I think it is a better place to do it, and I think it's just he's in a wet shirt and he's like very romantic, and then they fight and they almost kiss as they're fighting, right? They kind of like yeah, lean it's into much more ironic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I think that's why the Austin people don't like it because it feels much more romantic than comedy of manners esque. It, 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 you know, comedy of manners are sort of necessarily buttoned up because buttoning up is part of like how you button up what you button is, is sort of part of the, the rules of the game that shows some, that somebody is a romantic match for somebody else. But um, I really liked the movie when it got kind of over the top with the romance, except the very last scene when they're, kind of pledging their love to each other at Pemberley. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know if 
I, I saw one version of it where they cut that scene. It just wasn't there. Which one is that? I don't even remember that. Oh, the very last scene in the 05 one where they're at Pemberley and like he's just saying how much he loves her. Oh, I might have zoned out. Oh, it's, <laughs> there, it's odd. The last time I saw this movie, uh, they cut it. So it just ends on Mr. Bennett. I think it, I think the version I saw might have done that. Done that, yeah, because it's just so weird and like. So what it is is it's Darcy and Elizabeth are at Pemberley, and she's just, and he's just saying, what, I forget what he's saying. Do you remember KJ? It's just kind of yeah, not exactly, but it was you know it was hashtag mushy, like it was just yeah. I think that wasn't in the version I watched then. Yeah, I think a lot. Of, maybe they had cut that because it's just so. It's just such a bad note to end on. Um, you know, one thing the movie does um, film wise, cinematography wise, I don't know, cinematography, um, blocking and stuff wise compared yeah. to the to the 95 show is in the 95 show, every room is crowded with people. There's always more people than need to be there. Whereas in the 05 one, there's space in all these rooms. They can walk around. They can move around. You, you get a, a much more sense of um, gravitas in these rooms because which I think helps show how rich some of the people were. Whereas in the Bennett's house, the rooms were a little smaller, a little tighter. Whereas in the 95 one, none of the rooms felt big because they always had tons of people in all the rooms. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think also what you're saying like about the blocking and the movement of it is the, the 05 one. And this is kind of a Joe Wright thing. He does this in, in all of his movies is they're, they're very carefully blocked. Um, and so, yeah, the people moving through space is just very, very visually arresting. You don't need a lot of words to do that. And I think that one, that long shot, when they are first at the party and um, Collins is pursuing Lizzie before <laughs> he makes his awkward proposal the next day, um, it's it's lovely because it starts with them like going in and you see Collins and he's looking around for her. And he's and so short. He's so <laughs> short. And I, I like when he meets Mr. Darcy for the first time and like the elbow almost takes his head off when Darcy turns around. But um, it, it starts with that single shot. And then this, it, this single shot, they have another single shot at the end and it moves from um, Mary crying and her father comforting her. And then it moves in kind of the same pattern back to Collins and he's holding like a little flower and smelling it. And you can yeah. kind of see this sort of like it, by the end of this evening, he's even more taken with her or whatnot. And then it finally ends on, on Elizabeth herself. Um, but like that kind of movement in that space is it, it not only is really interesting to watch and it gives a better sense. I think the 05 version gives a better sense of what these houses are like. And why this house is more valuable than that house and why Pemberley is much more Absolutely. valuable than any of the houses. Um, but I think also you get a lot of storytelling without words in those scenes, right? You get this kind of, you get the relationship between Mary and the father, right? Like he's actually seems like he's trying to be a good, like it gives him more credit as a father um, just in that scene. Cause you get an opportunity to see him kind of comfort one of his crying girls and you get to see, how Collins is feeling by virtue of him not just saying something, but by the way, the camera is moving around this space and you get to see kind of Darcy like lurking in the background and looks at them and, and kind of moves away. Um, so I think like a lot of the camera movement does some of the storytelling and it's a much better sense of location. Those locations really do feel like characters. They don't quite in the, in the 95 version. I agree with that. Yeah. So would we say that um, this adaptation brings the source to more people? Does it reach a bigger or different audience? Uh, does it reach the audience better than the original source? Well, the wishbone one <laughs> is, <laughs> is a very different. No, I think if I had to go with this way, the 95 version is meant for people who have read Jane Austen before and already know it and really like it and are and want to see pride and prejudice on the screen that's what they want to see the 2005 one is meant for people who ideally haven't read pride and prejudice and don't necessarily know what it was they know it's a famous book and they want to know what the story is essentially it's it's not quite saying that like you know the 95 version is for the book and the 2005 version is the cliff notes version but it 
it it's not that far from it and it's not like not to mean that in a dismissive way it's that the 95 version is you love it you want to be immersed in it you want to spend a lot of time with it you want to see all of it you don't want to miss a drop of it but the 2005 version is you just want to know what it is and i think the 2005 version actually does a really good job of getting you what pride and prejudice is in two hours I um you know I I had this was my introduction to Pride and Prejudice I I'm sure I've heard the word before I I think I was more aware of Pride and Prejudice and zombies than Pride and Prejudice but hearing but you guys now talk you about, can read the book that I <laughs> not being funny after watching the movie and spending time with these characters it's a little bit like Friends like I do want to spend more time with these characters and reading the book is actually I'm thinking I'm gonna I do add it to I actually list. do want to, I did not want to reread the book after watching the 95 one I did want to rewatch reread the book after watching the 2005 but one of the things you guys have said is pretty way more often in this episode than previous episodes although I'm not exactly sure about three body problem but you guys keep saying well if if you're showing up for the miniseries you've probably read the book or if you're watching the movie you know it's a book and you you're probably somewhat familiar with it and i think a lot of schools do it i think right and, and at least in the states a lot of schools um have the students read pride and prejudice so i don't know if the movie's had a bigger reach or are they going to stay in the in the the zeitgeist or whatever you want to say for for any length of time in 50 years are people still going to watch these or are they going to read the book or they're going to watch the latest version of pride and prejudice. Like there's, there's a lot of versions of pride and prejudice, right? Like it's been adapted many times. I don't think either of these movies are going to survive a hundred years. No, I it's been adapted into a lot of books. Like people keep writing book versions or alternate versions of pride and prejudice where there's one where like Darcy is a female chef and the, and the Lizzie character is a doctor and you know what it like that type of thing so it's that doesn't sound like the same book at all <laughs> no it's I mean it's 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 pride and prejudice but it takes place in the 21st century there's pride and prejudice where the like an Islamic version that exists the Eastern Caribbean version like there, there's you could certainly make many of those work yeah um you could it's well, just basically to, just to interrupt like like Nick mm-hmm. used to I think there's been 17 movies. There's been that 17 are, movies? That, I'm saying there's a what? lot. Since 1938, there's 17 movies that wow. have been made of Pride and Prejudice. I didn't realize that it was that surprise me at all. Yeah, oh, didn't surprise okay. me at all. I, I didn't realize it was that that much. Right. I mean, we saw that Orson Welles Jane Eyre. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we, we didn't know it existed until that you told me that. was a bad movie. Yeah. But it's like everyone's making They They just took all these things. Yeah. Oh. But um, I, I think, so the 95 version for a lot of people was really important. And I, I don't quite know what that generation is, but like um, the people I know who are, who are really into Jane Austen or Jane Austen scholars, um, the 95 version was, was a big thing. And I think it launched in a lot of ways, Colin Firth's career who played Darcy. Um, and he was a big heartthrob because he was Darcy. Like it was Colin Firth as Darcy was, was the heart. He's throb. the better Darcy. He is definitely the better Darcy. Except for Wishbone. Yeah, except for Wishbone. Um, I like Matthew McFadden in the... I think <laughs> he Matthew is Mc... good, but Colin Firth is the better Darcy, and Kieran Knightley mm-hmm. is the better okay. Elizabeth Bennet. Yeah. I, I actually, I want to know why um, as the next question, but because uh, I'm not entirely sure if I agree. I'm, I don't know. Um, but I think the 95 version was a big deal for people, and I think it kind of still is. I think people are are interested in that. I think it recently had its... What, whatever it's like it's 30th year anniversary or, or whatnot um and they like brought the actors back to interview them i think this is one of the bigger like bbc classic successes will the 05 version be remembered in 100 years i don't know probably not um but i do think like the 05 version does it, w- it was very successful um and i think it also kind of somewhat launched matthew mcfadden's career I think he's on a television show now on hbo about a about a newspaper or something that gets inherited by other people i don't know secession i think it's called um succession yes yeah like like you like the, the yes, somebody yes. who takes over yeah um why what did i say no i mean isn't that a pretty well-known not a pretty oh, well-known oh is it a well-known series? television show? oh oh yeah no <laughs> so, not, not yeah <laughs> that was my point oh oh yeah um yeah, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, I think it's pretty well known. Anyway, um, but yeah, I, I agree with that. I don't think 
05 will be remembered in 100 years. I think 95 has a sort of time capsule feel. Like, like it feels like this was the um, this was the fun version of Pride and Prejudice that a lot of these like nerdy people like, uh, and I think it has that has actually lasted a little while. People are still watching that and talking about it and writing about it. Um, I like the O five version more, but it doesn't have that effect. It doesn't have a sort of built in audience that this that the BBC is able to to bring out. But anyway, I, I actually am curious. Who, why do you guys think, who do you think is the better Darcy or Lizzie and why? I think Kira Knightley is the, I mean, I, here's the problem is that Kira Knightley is the better because it, uh, I gotta, I gotta, Kira Knightley is the better Elizabeth Bennett because to a modern audience, it's very clear her independence and why she's more interesting. Because, and it's not just because, like, the very first scene is her holding a book. Like, that's movie shorthand for, like, you should be sympathetic to this character. They read <laughs> yeah. a book. Yeah. That's, like, it's that's like movie saving sh- a cat. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, that's movie shorthand. And, and yeah, it does indulge in that. But she is much, much more clearly obvious to a modern audience why she's interesting. I don't think, like, I, and it's, I, I don't want to criticize the 95 one because whoever that actress is. Elizabeth e- Eel? Or it's spelled E-H-L-E, but I don't know how to pronounce it. Oh, Jennifer. Jennifer. She is, it's still a great performance, but it's not as obvious to a modern audience why she is interesting. She does not strike a modern audience as it being, at least to me, she doesn't strike me as being as interesting as Kira Knightley does. Whereas Darcy, I don't know, I mean, it's just Colin Firth. I mean, he's just a much more dynamic stage presence. Like, I just feel like on the screen, I'm, I just immediately, you just, you just are much more interested in that man than the, the, than the Darcy and Karen Knightley's version. It's not to be that he's not interesting. It's just Colin Firth is, he, you know, he was the king. He was the king of the king's speech. He just, he, he pulls your attention <laughs> much more than the other one does. So I think, at least to me, that's why it's that Kieran Knightley strikes me as being much more interesting as a modern woman. And I think that she's supposed to be a modern woman. That's sort of the point. She's supposed to be basically Jane Austen. I think that's what Jane Austen sort of saw herself as to some extent. Mm-hmm. And so I think Kieran Knightley interests me much more in that sense. And I don't know what it is about Colin Firth. He just has a much more interesting presence to me. Yeah. The, I, I, I think I agree. Colin Firth stood out in the 95 version because I think he was such a better actor than everybody else he was with. And and I've, I've mentioned this on our other show, Keep Making Movies. I generally can't see a poor performance. Like, I can get lost in a good performance, but I, I just, I have this, I'm kind of lucky I have this acting blindness to poor performances. But I think... Enjoy movies more, probably. Right? That's what I think our other yeah, show, Keep Making know. Movies. It's based on, you know, not being able I, to... I enjoy know. Fast and the Furious. <laughs> yeah. The first one I, anyway. So the <laughs> um I think I think B- Colin Firth stands out in that one because he's a better actor, but I don't think he fits in the movie as well as the 05 Colin Firth, the 05 Mr. Darcy. Oh, he doesn't fit. What do you mean he doesn't fit in the movie? I I think it's I don't know if he's always shot from below and everybody else is shot from above. There's whenever he was on the screen like Pat was saying, you have to look at him, but it wasn't like, oh, cuz he he brought the scene together or he blended it well. It it almost felt like um, he stood out because he was – actually, Tom, you know, you talk about how the light just shines on some actors more than mm-hmm. others. Like He has that, and then no, it yeah, outshines – every, Right, star quality. And I think it yes. it, it doesn't fit that. in the, the BBC miniseries. And maybe that's what Karen Knightley's problem is. Not problem, but – Oh, in know, the 05 that's one, what yeah. Knightley's situation mm-hmm. is, too. Mm-hmm. But if I had to pick a character to shine in this story, it would be – Elizabeth Bennett, as opposed to Mr. Darcy. That is her story. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I, I don't know who I prefer or not. I, I sort of like them both. I, I think, yeah, Keira Knightley is, her Lizzie is, like you're saying, Pat, more modern. I mean, she just moves more. Even the outfits are, are less Her outfits are loose. It's almost like yeah. she's wearing nightgowns half the time. And I love yeah. it. Like they're both, they, I do want to make it very clear. I like both of them quite a mm-hmm. bit. I don't want to trash them. So, yeah, it's, it's totally true. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah, she can move around. She also, 
she has like a natural flirtatiousness. Um, I, I love the way she delivers that line. It's a, well, maybe you should take your aunt's advice and practice, you know? That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a great, great dig. I, I think Matthew McFadden, who's the 05 Darcy, I, I think what differs in his performance is he's, he's really pulling on that line that is in all of them, you know, in the book and both versions, where he says, I do not have that ease of speaking with people with whom I am not familiar, right? To which she says, take your hands if I some practice. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's sort of the grounding idea of the character is that he's just super uncomfortable in these social situations. Like he is cultivated all of these manners and, and you know, the the best way of going about things in any kind of social situation, um, in part because he's just really uncomfortable with people he doesn't know. Um, like he is just kind of, he's like an awkward guy. And from her perspective, it's, he's just incredibly prideful. And to a certain extent he is, but I think that's what McFadden is doing. He's playing this character as just I'm really awkward. I really don't like this. Um, and you don't realize that until you're well into the movie. It becomes clear, oh, that this guy isn't just a dick. He's like, he goes into that party and he's like, mm, I, I don't know anyone here. I don't know what to say. I don't know. You know, um, I will give I, him credit, though, to that point, though, I will agree. But he does a he actually this is where I think he he exceeds Colin Firth. He does a better job of showing the transition, and it's when he's with his sister at the piano. Mm -hmm. Yes, that great that great little scene where he's she's looking through the window, and then they have mm -hmm. a scene, and she he sees her through the through the mm -hmm. door crack. That's actually really good. That's a well well done piece of cinema, and that actually transition you actually are like oh, and again I you know if you don't know the film, you're like, Oh, I get it now. He's actually like really good. Like look at him with someone he knows he's, he actually, he, he makes that transition a lot more successfully than Colin Firth's one does. Yeah, I agree. I think so. And I think Colin Firth's character is, is much more, um, they talk more about his youth in the 95 version because they have the, the space to, and it's, you know, he, he's kind of, um, he, as a youth, he was like warm hearted, but but also very proud. And I think Colin Firth's character is much more uh, he's much colder. I don't think the social awkwardness is the kind of grounding principle that Colin Firth is working with. I think there is this sort of, um, you know, once my good opinion is lost, it's lost forever. That sort of icy standard he sets, I think, is what comes forth more in in his character. And I think you're right. And that's why that transition doesn't, it doesn't, it's not like it doesn't work in the 95 version, but it isn't as pronounced. Well, in the 05 version, I think it, it's, you're right. I think that scene where you see him with Georgiana, it's like, yeah, oh, this guy is actually quite warm to people. It's not only he's a good guy, he does the right thing when he needs to, a la Wickham. He actually can be very warm of a person. Um, even when Colin Firth is with Georgiana, like, in, in the 95 version, he's still not warm. He's slightly more relaxed, but he's, he's not, you know, he's not somebody like who'll run into his sister's arms and hug her, right? That's not, this character is not going to do that, even if he loves her and means her well. Yeah, and I like Jennifer Ely. I don't know how to pronounce E-H-L-E. -E. I don't know who she is. Yeah, Ely. Uh, um, uh, Lizzie in the 95 version. Oh, the 95 version. Yeah, she's my good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah she's good. I, I think, yeah, she has, um, she has a sort of stage presence too. Like she attracts the eye a lot. Uh, but it is. They're a, all wonderfully cast. Like there yeah. is, there is no mm -hmm. one who shouldn't be cast in the role in, they their, cast. in their roles. Mm -hmm. Like even the Bingley in the 2005 version, I, cause I couldn't remember what I'd seen him in. And I looked, I'm like, oh, he was in Rome. He was in the, the HBO series Rome. Do we feel the author's authority in the adaptation? In the 95 one, yes. And and I think, you know, this is and I and I actually think it works quite well. I don't think there is any, you know, there are changes in the 95 version, but nothing major. Like I think it's it's quite it's quite and this is why I say that the 95 version 
is an is a Jane Austen adaptation for Jane Austen fans. It follows it well. It's there's nothing major to object to, and I think it works quite well. In the two thousand five one, yes, there are there are, there are changes many of which would be totally and utterly unacceptable to that author. She would utterly reject them. But I, you know, the Bible one's quite interesting. And I think it would draw more of an audience in to wanting to read the book than the 95 one. I want to read. I, I do want to reread it. I really do really want to go back to it because it, it really interests me. And there are things that it drew out that I think I missed that I would like to go back to because of the 2005 version. Yeah, that, that actually happened to me. I was watching the 2005 version very recently and went back and read the book, you know, the, the next day um, on a plane ride back from Spain. <laughs> they, they, they had this on next to Fast and the Furious 10. And there are 10? <laughs> there's 11. There's 11 because there's the spinoff. Um, hey. Yeah, and Fast and the Furious 10, I'm sorry. It, it's really hard to watch that that's a rough movie um but so yeah put this on and it did inspire me to want to go back to the book again and, and i did reread the book um i do think you've i would say that i think it's not so jane austen is really really worried about like not preserving englishness like manners and 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 the customs of a place which kind of makes sense at the time she's writing right like the seven you know where france is kind of a threat um I did appreciate the 2005 movie actually referenced that because she doesn't reference the war at all. And yet the 2005 movie makes a number of references to France. The only reference that the 95 one makes is comically enough when uh, Wickham is leaving and he says au revoir as the French oh, say, yeah. <laughs> which yeah. is brilliant. Yeah, You're yeah. at war with them. Why are yeah. you speaking <laughs> their <laughs> language? Yeah. It's great. But yeah, it's, that it's was like... It, uh, yeah. By the way, don't like this guy, right? That's like it was little... brilliant. I mean, yeah, I think that's a really nice touch. But the 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 2005 movie actually makes some nice little references to the French. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I think that's that's what she's interested in. Um, but I would say this, like I said this before, I think where the the biggest violation of I wouldn't call it a violation because it doesn't matter. Right? It doesn't matter if we respect the author's authority or not. But the biggest change anyway in the 95 version is I think when you take it out of Elizabeth Bennet's hands, um, when you haven't, when you, she's not part of the narrative structure anymore, that's very different from the Austen novel. That's, that's the point more so than the, you know, Darcy riding a horse romantically through the woods that seemed very, very different from what, Austin had intended. Um, and it's very, it's not a lot. It, it's these little brief moments and whatnot. I mean, you know, the, the one that is most surprising is what you mentioned, Pat, where Darcy's going through London and we, we covered this already. But I think that's where the authority is, of the two versions, the authority is least felt is in those bits. Um, I think KJ's right. Colin Firth's agent was very... <laughs> <laughs> he, wasn't going to be, he wasn't going to give his stony face <laughs> for a whole episode. Yes. I mean, he needed to stare and shove people aside and go, excuse yes. me. Excuse me. <laughs> I must. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure about the author's authority, but I did look up overcoats on Amazon just to see, you know, what that might, if that would work out. This movie definitely made me feel like I should get an overcoat oh long, yeah trench coat yeah right <laughs> i all right that's i i have all long coats um i'm i'm well prepared for Just something to sway as, mm -hmm. as i'm going through the country then next we need to mm -hmm. go into film noir <laughs> <laughs> i bet we should if you enjoyed Pride and Prejudice and are looking for more adaptations of Pride and Prejudice including any of the 17 film adaptations a BBC produced radio drama from 2014, a manga series adaptation from 2020, or the 2016 coloring books for adults. Please find those on your own. I'm not going to tell you where they're located. You can rate and review this show anywhere fine podcasts are available. For those viewing in YouTube land, if you haven't already, Please like this video, subscribe to the Talking Studios channel for all our exciting content, 
and follow us on social media at Talking Studios. Check out other shows by Talking Studios, including Talking Pictures Trivia, where we explore movies through trivia, Keep Making Movies, where we explore micro-budget films, Limited Lexicon, where we play through text-based adventure games, and Get the Point, where we slowly reveal a movie poster and try to guess which movie poster it is. Got a question for us? Call the Talking Studios hotline at 201-467-8679 and leave a message. It may be featured on a future episode. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to Adapt It, wherever fine podcasts are found. Join us next week when we discuss A Game of Thrones and look at the 2011 TV show Game of Thrones. Wow, Talking Studios. Next week we'll be discussing Game of Thrones. Pat, if you could adapt a Game of Thrones into any medium, what would it be? I would like to see someone do like a Bayou tapestry of the Game of Thrones, like just, <laughs> just like a cathedral length, hand woe, you know, hand stitched tapestry of some sort, so that you know, in 2000 years, someone will find that tapestry and nothing else and wonder. What happened in the year, <laughs> year two thousand? What, what were they doing? <laughs> this is horrible. <laughs> so, Pat, did you did you watch uh, after the show was done? They made a making of documentary, which was really cool, um, just for the logistics of how to put a show like this together. But all the interstitials was a really cool tapestry. I don't think they literally made it. I think it was all you know computer generated, but. Uh, if you want to see what one could look like, uh, you know, check I will. Out I will have to check that out. But I want. Yeah. I want someone to make it and then bury it in it. Something that will, <laughs> that will, that will survive. <laughs> that will survive a nuclear <laughs> explosion. So, and then, when all history is lost, they will find that and wonder <laughs> if this was real. KJ, what about you? If you could adapt Game of Thrones into anything, what would you do? So, guys, this weekend I'm going to go see Spam a lot which I've not seen yet. I'm really excited. Mm-hmm. It's at the high school. The high school puts on really good uh, really good plays. We've seen Phantom there, Mamma Mia. We're going to see Spam a lot. I would love for somebody to take a piece of A Song of Ice and Fire and make the musical A Song of Ice and Fire. <laughs> I want it to be campy. I want it to be corny. I, I, I just think that could be a lot of fun right hodor's big number like there's just there's mm-hmm. so many so much material <laughs> on to... the ritz. <laughs> <laughs> hodor on the ritz yeah it would be... <laughs> right, there's... <laughs> there's a lot to work with there. <laughs> how about you tom how would you adapt to game of thrones um i don't know so i would my thing would be like I would like to see the cathedral or the church of is it the seven gods The Seven Gods are the more recent ones, right? And then there's the Old Gods. Yep, yep. Right. So I would like to see the the building that worshipped the Seven Gods. Like, what would that look like? What would their, you know, what would their windows look like? What would their prayer books, if they have them, look like? Like, do you have a sort of chorus or an organ or something like that 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 works in there? Is there plain chant? Is there a Game of Thrones plain chant that that is in this cathedral? I think that I would like to see as the uh, as the media. <laughs> so you want the Sept of Baelor cosplayed real life, almost like how they did with Lord of the Rings in New Zealand. You you want a place where you can go that is the Sept of Baelor. Is the Sept of Baelor the name of the the That's church? The, the big church in King's Landing. Oh, okay. Yes, I would like I would like to see that just to see what that reality would look like. Because I feel it'd be like nice and multimedia, right? Because you'd have these like songs you could hear, and then there would have to be some sort of icons on the wall that sort sure. of told me who these seven gods are and whatever. You could probably go see it in Dubrovnik. I bet that exists in Dubrovnik. Yeah, it's probably there. Yeah. What's Dubrovnik? Yeah, what's Dubrovnik? That's, that was King's Landing. Oh, oh, that's where they filmed it, Dubrovnik. Oh, in okay. Croatia. Yeah. Or oh wow, that was, mm-hmm. that was King's Landing. All right, guys. Well, uh, audience, if you're out there and we make a Patreon. 
our, our one of our stretch goals is all going out to Dubrovna to see the Sept of Baylor. <laughs> or to fund the Hodor musical that KJ has come up with. <laughs> <laughs> Game of Thrones is on max, probably will be forever, and certainly at the time of this recording. I could be I could be mixing it up with like the tenant of Wildfell Hall, which is like intolerable. <laughs> I think it could be oh, one of those. I have not read that. Um That's Anne Bronte. Yeah, and I've not read Anne Bronte. I've Don't. Only, I, yeah. <laughs>